boa tarde a todos. Nós vamos dar início à conferência de encerramento do sexto SILF, com a fala do professor Dr. Lahan Mackenzie, intitulada Funcionalismo, 10 anos do SILF. Em nome do Sebastião Carlos e em meu próprio, eu gostaria de agradecer ao professor Lahan Mackenzie por prontamente ter aceito o nosso convite para voltar ao SILF nessa edição de comemoração dos 10 anos de existência do nosso simpósio. Como todos sabem, o professor Larman foi conferencista convidado da primeira edição do SILF em 2010 na Universidade Federal de Mato Grosso do Sul, nada mais oportuno de, do, e feliz do que poder contar com ele agora nos nossos 10 anos. O professor Larman é professor emérito de Linguística Funcional na Universidade Livre de Amsterdã, onde vem trabalhando há mais de 40 anos. Digo assim, no gerúndio, no aspecto cursivo, porque ao professor Mackenzie não se aplica o traço aposentado. Poucas pessoas são tão ativas em todas as frentes da vida acadêmica quanto ele. Além das inúmeras atividades como consultor em importantes, em importantes instâncias da educação na comunidade europeia, o professor Mackenzie continua atuando como pesquisador e ministrando na pós-graduação de diferentes universidades cursos sobre gramática discursivo-funcional, teoria que foi desenvolvida por Kess Rengeveld e Lachlan Mackenzie em uma parceria muito profícua que continua nos brindando com pesquisas que esclarecem os mais intrincados e instigantes temas da GDF. O volume de publicações do professor Larran, tanto bibliográficas como em eventos mundo afora, dá uma pequena noção da sua incansável produtividade. Embora essa apresentação devesse ser apenas sob aspectos profissionais do professor, a quem todos carinhosamente chamamos apenas de Larran, eu tomo a liberdade de me referir a um aspecto pessoal que tem feito a diferença na trajetória acadêmica daqueles que têm a sorte de com ele conviver. Lahan é um pesquisador extremamente ético e extremamente generoso, que divide com todos os, o seu saber, o que faz com que seus comentários na discussão dos nossos trabalhos, sempre proferidos na mais gentil forma possível, levem as pesquisas a um novo patamar melhor e mais consistente. Só os grandes sabem fazer isso, e não resta dúvida de que estamos diante de um grande linguista e um grande homem. Que todos aproveitem a sua fala, com a certeza de que sairemos também engrandecidos desse nosso contato, ainda que virtual. Passo então a palavra a você, Lahan, que terá uma hora para sua fala, e depois mais 20 minutos para as perguntas e comentários. Mais uma vez, muito obrigada. Good afternoon, everyone. Eleven years ago, at the first SILF, as Marise just mentioned, I was invited to give a plenary presentation about functional discourse grammar, which had been introduced to the world of linguistics just three years earlier in a book by Case Hengefeld and myself, in which the theory was set out in an introduction and four long chapters. But inevitably, many details had to be left implicit or undeveloped. In the intervening years, a community of scholars in various countries of the world, notably the Netherlands and Brazil, but elsewhere too, have devoted themselves to developing FDG. The time has come to take stock. So the questions I'd like to ask in um, my talk today are the following. What is distinctive about FDG? There are many rival theories around. What properties justify the existence of FDG and encourage its adoption by scholars of linguistics? And secondly, <clears throat> how has FDG developed in the last decade or so? What progress has been achieved? Before advancing, I wish to thank the organizers of uh, this magnificent event for putting together a wonderfully varied 
and stimulating program that proves that functionalism is very much alive, although who doubted it, alive and indeed thriving, both in Brazil and internationally, and to thank them for being kind enough to involve me in this way. <clears throat> in particular, I want to address my gratitude to Sebastian Carlos Schleit Consalch, who has kept me fully informed about the plans from the earliest stages of preparation. And of course, Maris Mach Dalario Atner, like Carlos from UNESP at uh, San Juan uh, du Rio Preto, for her very kind words of introduction today and for acting as the moderator of this plenum. I argued in a 2016 article entitled in Portuguese, Uma Primeira História da Gramática Funcional, First History of Functional Grammar, kindly translated for publication in Brazil by Jorge Henrique Nakamura. I argued that FTG arose in response to interests that came up among practitioners of Simon Dick's functional grammar in the 90s of last century. Those interests emerged in tandem with the increasing availability of corpora of modern languages, as well as developments in the study of classical languages. Now, every functionally oriented approach to grammar has been concerned, among other things, with what may be called the impact of discourse upon morphosyntax and prosody. This has been true from the, the Prague School onwards. Even the theories most strongly oriented to the autonomy of syntax have come to appreciate the extent to which grammars oblige speakers to take account of such discoursal notions as elocution, topicality, vocality, emphasis, anaphora, cataphora, and so on, and to integrate them into their formalism. Of course, their approach forces them to deal with this in terms of syntax, hence such categories in their work as focus phrase, force phrase, and so on, as constituents of the sentence or clause. The first thing that uh, is distinctive about FDG is that it is explicitly not a, uh, a, a grammar of the sentence or the clause, but a grammar of the discourse act. That is, it's concerned with the form of utterances as protocols of human verbal activity. In a sense, then, FDG could be read as functional discourse act, grammar. It is, not, it is an account, then, of how discourse acts, or groupings of discourse acts called moves, are expressed in the languages of the world. The assumption is that all languages are characterized by the chunking of the discourse flow into units that have prosodic separateness and reflect the human need to speak on a series of outbreaths. This is generally accepted, for example, in the rhetorical structure theory concept of elementary discourse units. It's perhaps most strongly associated with the work of the late Wallace Chafe. On page 58 of his final book, Thought-Based Linguistics, he writes, it appears to be true of all languages that the flow of spontaneous speech can be segmented into intonation units. And on the previous page, he had written that <clears throat> thinking occurs in spurts, which find expression in both the syntax and the prosody of language. What Chafe seems to mean here is the chunky nature of thinking for language, i.e. thinking for communication. All this has the corollary that the object of examination is not some idealized, cleaned up version of speech that supposedly reflects the speaker's competence or so-called I language, but rather actual units of speech as transcribed in a corpus, a corpus of the kind gratefully and liberally used for the examination of Portuguese in all its many varieties in the FDG research conducted in Brazil. This makes for another distinctive property of FDG, which sets it apart from various branches of formal grammar. Its orientation to real data. This distinctive property also provides a smoother transition from the study of transcriptions of languages with writing systems <clears throat> 
to the study of exclusively or primarily oral languages in the tradition of language typology, to which FDG also seeks to make a contribution. In fact, the title of the 2008 book explicitly describes FDG as offering a typologically based theory of language. But what distinguishes FDG from the bulk of work in linguistic typology is that in some ways, like initiatives in formal or generative linguistics, the analyses that are offered are formalized analyses. That is, they're presented in symbolic form in order to achieve a maximum degree of precision and comparability across the description of different phenomena and different languages. These formalized representations clearly set FDG apart from large swathes of typological work, as well as more cognitive and language descriptive approaches. I admit that one may debate whether the benefits of the relative precision outweigh the disadvantages of forcing beginners and more senior colleagues too, to learn yet another formalism. Clearly, if there ever was a hope that typologists would turn in large numbers to FDG as a framework for their findings, that hope has been dashed on the rocks of realism. That is not to deny, however, that typological work in the FDG framework has been published, but generally by researchers already committed to that framework. Another distinctive property of FDG is its position with regard to the universal versus the particular. FDG here applies Occam's razor, entia non sunt multiplicanda praetor Rather than assuming or arguing that the structural properties of all languages are in a sense identical, FDG seeks to respect the formal properties of each individual language. If a language lacks forms that distinguish absolute tenses, for example, in having no morphological marking of past and present or past and non-past or whatever, then the underlying formalisms will also lack any indication of those distinctions. More technically, they will have no absolute tense operators. This is the essence of what we've called a form-oriented function-to-form architecture. That is, after recognizing a form, we posit the communicative function or functions it fulfills and then trace a pathway from those functions to the form. The relevance for universals is that the description of a language is true to the facts of that language. Language comparison must be postponed until the facts have been ascertained. Universality is never an assumption. At best, it may be a conclusion drawn from empirical work. In other words, universals are induced from the data and then tested. They're not hypothesized in advance of the language analysis. One property of FDG strongly aligns it with the typological tradition, the use of implicational hierarchies to display the results of language comparison. Comparing the descriptions of languages frequently leads to the conclusion that the languages differ in surprisingly organized ways. For example, if we take the set of monomorphemic content interrogatives, who, what, where, when, how, how many, or how much, why, we may not be surprised to learn that languages differ with regard to which of the set they contain as monomorphemic units. Portuguese with porque lacks a monomorphemic why, but possesses a monomorphemic how much, or how many, in quanto, which English evidently lacks, and so on. However, it can be shown that languages do not differ at random. For example, we don't find languages in which there's a morpheme for why, but not one for what. Similarly, in work done in Brazil in 2007 with indigenous languages, it was shown by a large team of FDG researchers that various implicational hierarchies of this type apply to the presence of elocutionary categories in those languages. Now, a, a further distinctive property 
of FDG is that the grammar is explicitly regarded as one of a system of components of human discoursal communication. In other words, the grammar as a whole forms one component that is flanked and supported by three others. And quite a lot of the work carried out since the presentation of the theory in 2008 has been devoted to reflection on the nature of those three supporting components, the conceptual component, the contextual component, and the output component. However, the bulk of the work done by the FDG community since 2008 has, of course, been focused on the grammatical component. This component consists, as is shown in the slide, of four modules, <clears throat> each of which generates a level of analysis. What is distinctive about FDG is that, unlike other approaches I know, equal status is given to not only the semantic, morphosyntactic, and phonological levels, as in many other models, but also to the pragmatic and rhetorical level, known as the interpersonal level. In fact, as we shall see, it plays a dominant role in FDG. In Kullakover and Jackendorf's parallel architecture, we find three modules that are strongly reminiscent of FDG's representational morphosyntactic and phonological levels, but there's nothing there corresponding to the distinctive interpersonal level. Similarly, in its most recent version, Jackendorf and Argling's relational morphology the authors explicitly write on page seven of their book, The Texture of the Lexicon, that, I quote them, semantics can be seen as containing separate tiers of propositional structure, who did what to whom, and information structure, topic focus, common ground, discourse old versus discourse new information, etc. But it's not clear in what sense the latter can be regarded as semantics. As when, for example, on page 121, they describe the uh, Tagalog um infix as betokening agent focus within their semantics. In Gerald Sadock's modular architecture of grammar, there are no fewer than six modules, but none is concerned with the questions to which FDG dedicates its interpersonal level. Sadock, on page 100 of his book, explicitly admits that Various types of discourse information, such as definiteness, figure and ground, and topic of comment, are left entirely out of the picture. Closer to FDG is Van Valen and Lapala's uh, Role and Reference Grammar, or RRG, which provides a semantic and a syntactic representation for each element analyzed, with a linking algorithm connecting the two in a rule-governed fashion. Discourse pragmatics does enter the picture, but as a sort of constraint on the algorithm. And it's represented in RRG work as running parallel to that algorithm, not as deserving an analytical level of its own. Similarly, the focus structure, as it's called, is projected onto the syntactic structure, but does not drive the algorithm that creates it. For a critical view within RRG, see Mitsuaki Shimojo's article, Focus Structure and Beyond, which does call for a more developed discourse representation to handle data from Japanese in RRG. What's very prominent, but not particularly distinctive perhaps about FDG, is its recourse to hierarchical structure, the nesting of one layer of analysis within another higher one. This kind of arrangement is familiar from the rank scales of systemic functional linguistics, such as sentence, subsentence, word, letter, in written English, or clause, phrase, word, morpheme, in spoken English. Or indeed, there's Sinclair and Coulthard's analysis of classroom discourse with the rank scale lesson, transaction, exchange, move, act. The specific application of the so-called layered structure of the clause is attributable to RRG, where we encounter uh, the sentence, the clause, the core, the nucleus, and the predicate. Note that all these scales are syntactic, tinged with semantics in the case of RRG. The hierarchization of syntax has, of course, been taken to extremes in the generative syntax of recent decades, 
especially in the cartographic variant, with multiple embeddings of phrases within phrases, an approach fostered and furthered by the analysis of morphological elements such as inflections and agreement morphemes as phrases. FDG also adopts hierarchical structure in the wake of Simon Dick's functional grammar. Its final statement, the theory of functional grammar, part one appearing in 1989 and part two posthumously in 1997, edited by Case Hengefeld, it immediately incorporated the hierarchical analysis of semantics that Case had proposed in 1989, replacing the flat semantic structure that had characterized previous editions. Now, what is distinctive about FDG, or at least relatively so, are two things, I believe. One is um, the adoption of hierarchical structure at all four levels of analysis. Blow this up, there we are. <clears throat> At the representational level, what we see is a refinement of the Hengefeld-Dick hierarchical approach to semantics. At the phonological level, what we get is an adaptation of the 1986 Nespor-Vogel prosodic phonology hierarchy which continues in many ways to reflect the consensus among phonologists. At the morphosyntactic level, but much less uh, extravagantly than in syntactocentric theories, there is also hierarchy. And rather unusually, but crucially, there's also hierarchy at the interpersonal level. Although I should admit that the detailed study in formal grammar of the so-called left periphery of the clause and of the occurrence of multiple discourse markers has driven other researchers too towards comparable claims and formalism. So, so all four levels are fundamentally hierarchical in nature. And what is basically the same symbolic structure is applied at each layer. I feel this is not only of scholarly interest, but also adds a certain aesthetic unity to FDG across the diversity of the four levels of analysis. The other distinctive property that the hierarchization, sorry, the other distinctive property is that the hierarchization is not applied to every single unit, as has happened in generative syntax and in the wake of Richard Kane's binary branching constraint. Um, FDG, in keeping with the various comparable functionalist approaches and, and with Kullakover and Jackendorf's simpler syntax, also allows the equipollent combination of any number of elements at the same level of a hierarchy to form what is called a configuration. And as we will now see the distinction between hierarchically and configurationally arranged elements is crucial for the understanding of the FDG approach to morpho syntax. A final distinctive trait of FDG then relates to the impact of the distinction between hierarchy and configuration. This has to be understood against the background of the dynamic implementation of the theory defined as being concerned with the sequence of steps that the analyst must take in understanding and laying bare the nature of a particular phenomenon. The analyst gradually builds up the morph morphosyntactic structure of the linguistic expression in response to the nature of the formulation structures established at the interpersonal and representational levels. Whereas in generative approaches, the syntax is central and is interpreted by the semantics and the phonology, FDG takes its functionalism to its logical conclusion and makes morphosyntactic structure highly dependent upon the pragmatics and semantics of the discourse that's being expressed. The syntactic structures that we encounter in languages are thus seen as subservient to the conveyance of meaning. So the, the art of syntax, if I can put it that way, is to render in linear form clues to the hierarchical and non-hierarchical structures 
that result from the processes of formulation. FDG operationalizes this by recognizing a small number of psychologically prominent positions in the sequencing of any unit of syntax. These are known as absolute positions and they're shown in red on the slide. Most prominent of these are the absolute initial and the absolute final position. And some languages are content with these two prominent landmarks and they build the rest of their syntax around them with relative positions after the initial position and also preceding the final position. Another salient position in syntax given recognition in many languages is the medial position with relative positions either preceding or following it. And lastly, it's been known at least since the times of the 19th century scholar Jakob Wackernader that languages may assign a special role to the second position as in the case of many Germanic and many early Romance languages in which the word order dances around this easily recognizable spot in the shadow of the initial position. Now in FDG, what determines which items get to occupy the absolute positions is in the first instance, the hierarchical positioning of the corresponding item at the formulation levels. Anything from the interpersonal level takes precedence over anything from the representational level in keeping with the principles of functionalism. This is uh, particularly evident in the case of so-called discourse markers, which in FDG are analyzed as either operators or modifiers at hierarchically high levels of the interpersonal level. And indeed, discourse markers in general occupy peripheral positions, signposting the role of what immediately follows or has immediately preceded. They therefore have first dibs at the initial or final position. And they may even come to occupy positions that we've recognized as, in a sense, even more peripheral. The uh, positions uh, pre and post. So adverbs, or more generally, adverbials that pertain to the interpersonal aspects of communication, like, like briefly when modifying a discourse act, sincerely modifying an elocution, or allegedly modifying a communicated content will, if there are no higher contenders for the absolute positions, be the first to be allocated a position. This is indeed a distinctive feature of FDG since the norm across grammatical theories is for adverbials to be seen as additions to, adjuncts to a basic predicational structure. So once all the interpersonal levels, uh, oh, sorry, once all the interpersonal elements have been given a position, the elements of the representational level come next in the dynamic implementation. But here too, it is the hierarchically highest that are placed first. This means that, again, it is the semantically modifying elements that set out the main milestones. It's only after the hierarchically arranged elements have been placed that the grammar turns to the configurational elements, notably those that make up the predicational structure of a clause, typically the verb and its arguments, which in FDG are all sisters, as it were, equipollent members, in other words, of the so-called configurational property. And these get the leftovers, if you like, occupying any absolute positions that remain, and otherwise having to be content with a relative position. However, if any of these bears a pragmatic function, topic, or focus, or contrast, then the corresponding subact will already have allowed it to be positioned by virtue of that interpersonal status. So it's all a bit complicated, but the takeaway message is that FDG syntax prioritizes interpersonal over representational meanings in determining constituent order, affecting some languages more than others, it should be said. And um, Erotil Pizzati's 2014 book, Our Dangerous Palabras in Portuguese, shows, using corpus data, how this very approach is applied to Portuguese constituent order. Right, 
Uh, to summarize what we've seen so far, FTG has a number of distinctive properties that define its positioning among the various approaches available at the present time. I would submit to you that these are essentially conditioned by the double orientation of the theory to functionalism and to typological adequacy. So it is a grammar of the discourse act. It is oriented to analyzing real data. It operates with formal analyses. It respects the properties of each language. It lends itself to language comparison. It gives priority to the interpersonal level of analysis and it adopts strict distinction between hierarchy and configuration. Now, having come to the halfway point, I would like now to move on to the second question that I originally asked and say a few words about the ways that FDG has developed since the publication of the book by Kate Hengathot and myself in 2008, and since I was given that opportunity to talk about FDG at the first SILF conference in 2011. Even though the 2008 book is quite lengthy and covers a lot of detail about the theory, it couldn't really go further than to present the four levels of analysis and the various levels that must be recognized, sorry, the various layers that must be recognized within each level. We intentionally cited many examples from a wide range of languages in order to encourage others to use the theory to explore the particular phenomena that interested them, whether they were confined to a single language or embraced the comparison of several languages, languages from the same family or not, or whether their aim was to achieve typological adequacy through the study of a worldwide sample. It's pleasing to note that um, FDG has uh, proved its worth for the description of individual languages as well. Many colleagues have found it a useful tool for the detailed analysis of Portuguese, for example. And others have used it to delve into such languages as English, Dutch, Spanish, and Arabic. Now, all of this has uh, clear implications for methodological issues. What we've seen in practice in the past years, that across the international FDG community, the style of argumentation and the types of data used to provide evidence for that argumentation have varied quite widely. This is entirely understandable in the light of the particular academic settings and the traditions and goals of each research group. Nevertheless, the cross-methodological adherence to the same principles of functional analysis holds the community and its work together and contributes to the gradual sophistication and refinement of the theory. FDG, as I've emphasized, is oriented to understanding grammar as an instrument of action and interaction. And this has encouraged the use of corpus data to clarify the embedding of each discourse act in its context. This is true not only of the already well-described languages I just mentioned, but often coupled to work with informants, it's also been the basis for the application of FDG to the description of poorly described and or minority languages. I could mention in this context Inge Gene's 2009 work on Blackfoot, Arok Wolvengray's 2011 thesis on Plains Cree, and the forthcoming grammar of Aingai, by Case Hengefeld and Raphael Fischer. In these cases, the researchers are obliged to put together their own corpora rather than making use of already existing collections of texts or transcriptions. And Case Hengefeld has talked in interesting ways about the challenge of using a formalized theory while keeping the grammar of Aingai accessible to linguists of all persuasions and perhaps more importantly, to the users of the language themselves. In addition, FDG has brought a new perspective to the study of well-documented languages, as in Maria Chandroyani's thesis on modern Greek mood, Tamara Terboul's 
doctoral dissertation on Korean, Hong Mai Fang's PhD on sentence final particles in Mandarin Chinese, Lynn Janssen's FDG analysis of Esperanto, or Matthew Anstey's study of biblical Hebrew. And in terms of different kinds of data sources, I'd like to mention Kasper Koch, whose 2016 doctoral thesis uses film data to study speech accompanying gestures in German from the viewpoint of FDG. And then, of course, there are the larger research groups or labs, as they're called these days. The many researchers at different campuses in Brazil working on Portuguese and in some cases on Spanish and overlapping of personnel, there are those who have used FDG to reveal interesting properties of indigenous uh, Brazilian languages. And let me also mention the group headed by Evelyn Kaiser in Vienna and Graz in Austria working on English, but alongside them, distinguished Spanish colleagues in English studies at such locations as Cordoba, Madrid, Yado, and the Canary Islands. And then Ahmed Mutawakil and his disciples working on Arabic and its dialects and publishing chiefly in Arabic, but sometimes also in French and in English. Because of its um, many layers and levels, FDG has the reputation among linguists in general of being horribly complex. There's a cost-benefit issue that arises in their minds. Is it worth it for me to learn the theory as against the advantages that will accrue to me? And many, sadly, too many, have answered that question in the negative. Perhaps the very distinctiveness I've talked about has its negative side. It's all too easy to get something published like the following. It comes from a perfectly respectable linguist in response to a discussion note that I was invited to write in response to an article by that linguist. And he wrote as follows. It's difficult for me to assess Mackenzie's points since he couches his critique in his own grammatical framework, namely functional discourse grammar, in which I am not versed. Okay, that means he has no knowledge of it. The points I'm now going to make should therefore be viewed with my lack of exposure to FDG in mind. My main difficulty concerns Mackenzie's notion of subact. The word subact occurs 26 times in his discussion note. In many of these 26 cases, I can replace subact with constituent to help make the point at hand more accessible to me. And so on. Even with the little I've said about FDG so far this afternoon, you all know that it is totally illicit, unacceptable to replace subact with constituent. But it is apparently acceptable to uh, almost boast about your ignorance of the um, field. Well, it's with this kind of challenge in mind that um, we have conducted a sort of information campaign we've placed instructive and explanatory articles in various handbooks and encyclopedias as well as translations of such articles into french spanish and portuguese in addition we've prefaced every collected volume and every special issue of a journal we've published with an introductory article going over many of the points I've made today, illustrating and contextualizing. Just last week, I took part in a workshop in which there were representatives of descriptive linguistics, construction grammar, minimalism, role and reference grammar, and then myself from FDG, and we were able to find various points of convergence I'm happy to relate, much as is happening at this very self but too much time still had to be spent on each representative explaining how and with which theoretical presuppositions he or she was working. In terms of the organization of the work of the FDG community as an international undertaking, we have a biennial conference at which, pandemics permitting, those who can travel to the meeting place get together to exchange ideas and experiences face to face. This year's one will take place next week in the Netherlands 
at a conference centre near to the bracing winds of the North Sea coast. In the intervening years, we always organise a thematic workshop at which we work through the various nooks and crannies of the theory. Past years, we've had workshops on the morphosyntactic level, the contextual component, the lexicon, derivational morphology, modification, various other topics. This has allowed us to fill in some of the blanks in ways that I'll come back to briefly in what follows. And now we actually also have monthly online meetings at which in a very unthreatening and supportive environment, FDG researchers can launch their ideas, gain reactions and stimulate debate. These activities are all excellent for the social and academic cohesion of the community, but the challenge of impacting linguistics at large remains present and our response has been to publish the papers arising from these various activities with a wide range of different publishers and a wide range of different journals. So, what advances have been achieved <clears throat> in these intervening years? Well, they've been many and varied, and any attempt of mine to summarize them is bound to reflect my personal biases and blind spots. What I feel I can maintain with some confidence is that FDG has not changed radically in the last 14 years. The fundamental architecture has been extended and refined, that's true, but not overthrown. We're all waiting expectantly to see what the next major statement of FDG will hold in terms of surprises. Case Hengefeld of Amsterdam, Ricardo Chomi of Liège, and Evelyn Kaiser of Vienna are currently preparing a book for Oxford University Press, provisionally entitled Layering in Functional Discourse Grammar, the Hierarchical Structure of the Language System. Now, this book is liable to become the go-to reference for future practitioners of FTG, but I think you'll agree that the working title, mentioning layering, hierarchical structure, and so on, suggests continuity rather than revolution. But we'll see. Predictably, um, the intervening years have been um, years of uh, reflection on the theory. Uh, Neil Smith, whose involvement with FDG was cut short by his decision to move out of linguistics, showed brilliantly in his book, um, For Your Information, that the Hegefeld and McKenzie treatment of information structure was insufficient in ways that still deserve uh, serious attention. Then um, Lucia Contreras Garcia took FDG and subjected it to rigorous comparison with generative grammar and with Ray Jackendorf's parallel architecture and questioned FDG's tendency to take intermediate positions. Indeed, it's a moot point whether right in the middle is a good place to find oneself. Neither radically functional nor radically formal, not a model of the speaker, but seeking to come as close as possible, modular, but also with elements of derivation. Perhaps FTG would make more of a splash, more of an impact, if it were a bit bolder in the style of construction grammars, everything is a construction, or minimalism's merge is all there is. In any case, Contreras Garcia's thesis made waves. Then um, Ricardo John has adopted a bold position in a thesis, the commercial version of which is due to appear not too long from now. And he takes the diachronic phenomenon of grammaticalization, which uh, despite its name has tended to be treated outside a rigorous grammatical theory. And he used FDG developing Case Engefeld's work to formulate a precise and limited set of empirically testable grammar internal constraints on what is possible and impossible in grammaticalization. One particular point worth mentioning is this. Jomi shows that de-grammaticalization, which has often been claimed to water down or even undermine the principle of grammaticalization, occurs only as the result of discourse act integration. In other words, it's an epiphenomenon of a well-attested independent grammatical development of a type that can be understood very naturally in an FDG context. 
A fourth, and for me uh, today final, area of reflection falls under the general rubric of transparency, the study of which gave rise to a whirlwind of research and a flurry of publications in the Netherlands, Brazil, and elsewhere, for example, in a special issue of the Brazilian journal, The Amish. Whereas our 2008 book distinguishes three principles that link formulation to encoding, namely iconicity, domain integrity, and functional stability, all of them very well justified functionally, Stella Lufkin's doctoral thesis, developed in close collaboration with Case Hengerfeld, showed that they all group together under the common denominator of transparency, and that this, that this notion could be modeled as a bijective relation between elements of the formulation levels and elements of the encoding levels. Where such a one-to-one -one relation does not obtain, then we have opacity, the opposite of transparency. And then languages or systems within languages can be assessed for their degree of transparency. The tenets of functionalism would lead you to expect that all languages will be transparent. In fact, they might be expected to be equally transparent but of course even a moment's reflection shows that this is not the case just take um, compound nouns for example found in many languages just um, more or less at random kind of insp inspired by uh, Stella Lufkin's um, car wash is a place to wash your car or have it washed a mouthwash it's a liquid to clean your mouth with. Backwash is the movement of waves as they leave the land. And hogwash is nonsense. And so on. The meaning of the compound is clearly opaque. This is just one very simple example. Another is the gender of nouns in a language like Portuguese, or indeed almost all Indo-European languages. English, by comparison, is said to be more transparent because it has um, sex rather than arbitrary gender. So, as Stella Lufkins writes, FDG takes this moderate position as it tries to explain form from its meaning, but nevertheless allows for form without a pragmatic or semantic motivation. Ah, there we have it again. FDG as the theory of moderation. Well, who knows? Several years ago in Trej Lagoesh, I had the pleasure of working with Thaisa Perez de Oliveira and her students on the question whether standard or vernacular Brazilian Portuguese was more transparent. And the question turned out to be harder to answer than we expected. We didn't really come up with, uh, with an answer. Part of the problem is that the FDG system is kind of loaded towards finding transparency in the sense that only those elements are included in formulation that have a corresponding expression in morphosyntax or phonology. In other words, we are comparing the structures of two systems that are not inherently independent of each other. Okay, so this question of the relationship between systems, that then raises the question of interfaces. Uh, interface is a notion that's recently played an important role in many frameworks and certainly not understood in the same way across those frameworks. This and the preceding work on transparency was the trigger for the community to prepare a book on interfaces that appeared last year, edited by Lucia Contreras Garcia and Daniel Garcia Velasco. One effect of this work was to recognize the need for much greater connectivity within the model. The uh, one-way, top-to-bottom orientation of the 2008 model was abandoned in favor of this, a more complex architecture, which is largely bi-directional or even multi-directional. The need was inspired, for example, by cases where the functioning of the morphosyntactic level is affected by properties of the uh, phonological level. These would clearly be impossible to account for without allowing for a kind of look ahead. In Tagalog, as described by Xi and Zurao, an attributive adjective can appear either before or after a noun. 
Well, this is generally true in Portuguese too, okay? A pobre menina and a menina pobre. But while the distinction in Portuguese is pragmatic semantic in nature and therefore causes no architectural problems, in Tagalog, the syntactic ordering is determined by a phonological factor, the need to avoid two adjacent nasal consonants. Now, in this modified architecture, we can account for this by retaining the unidirectionality of the grammar, but permitting lexical information, which includes the phonological shape of lexemes, to be passed upwards inside what we call the fund, from the set of phonological primitives to the set of morphosyntactic primitives, as shown by this arrow. Well, this then brings me quite naturally to the matter of the lexicon. In the tradition of many grammarians, in the early days of FDG, we all tended to downplay its importance and its complexity. The syntactic organization of linguistic expressions was what interested us, and it wasn't clear how the lexicon was relevant for that. Whereas in functional grammar, the preceding theory, each lexeme was associated with a rather fixed predicate frame, and predicate frames drawn from the lexicon were the starting point for the theory. And then the various grammatical processes operated upon those, expanding them with all the information that was needed. Now, FDG had turned that architecture on its head, starting with the Discourse Act, as I mentioned before. And the implementation of the theory, it, um, and in that implementation, it consulted the lexicon as and when it was needed. Now, in the overall uh, architecture, as the picture we saw before, the, com the speaker's communicative intention starts outside the grammar in what's called the conceptual component at the top there of that uh, diagram. Uh, and the lexicon, it is assumed, has no access to this conceptual component, nor does the conceptual component have access to the lexicon. Now, in an article called Reflections on the Lexicon, that case and I wrote, we defended an approach that's inspired by a consensus of the psycholinguistics of language production. So in that article, we propose that for each discourse act, the conceptual component develops a message in two stages. In the uh, first stage, very general settings are determined that are immediately passed on to the grammatical component where they trigger global choices of frames in formulation in such areas as givenness, topicality, anaphora, and valency. In the second stage, which comes later, other factors come into play, reflecting the speaker's intentions and strategy, the impact of the discourse context, the nature of the interaction, for example, the need to, to be polite in certain circumstances, in addition to the impact of entrenchment and priming, as well as, of course, <laughs> the structural and lexical properties of the, of the language being spoken. So together, these multiple factors spark off detailed choices in formulation, including the application of grammatical operators and, crucially, the selection of lexemes and their insertion into the frames that were established in the first phase. So one of the strongest pieces of evidence for this um, is um, the phenomenon of slips of the tongue, as when a speaker intends to say, we cooked a roast, and actually says, we roasted the cook. So our approach aligns with what happens, according to psycholinguists. Someone like um, Harley says, to quote, when we speak, we specify a syntactic plan or frame for a sentence that consists of a series of slots into which content words are inserted. What he calls word exchanges, that's slips of the tongue, 
occur when content words are put into the wrong slot. This approach, however, faces a challenge from the analysis of idioms, which were tackled from an FDG perspective by Evelyn Kaiser in a 2016 article. Now, she distinguishes uh, three types. Uh, the first is exemplified by the much quoted idiom, he kicked the bucket, meaning he died. This type is called unmotivated because nothing about kicking or buckets or kicking buckets has anything to do with dying. And it's also said to be semantically non-decomposable because there's no way in which the meaning of the whole can be understood as made up of the meaning of the parts. So Kaiser proposes that what we have here is a single ascriptive subact and a single if complex lexical property, kick the bucket insertable into the one place frame into which die would also fit in formulation. The uh, second type is exemplified by he hit the ceiling or he hit the roof, right? Both of which I mean, he became furious. This type can be classified as motivated because sudden fury is associated with wild bodily movements. And it's only a small exaggeration to imagine the person actually coming into contact with the ceiling. However, it's still semantically non-decomposable because as Evelyn Kaiser herself says, it is, quote, not clear how the component parts of the idiom contribute to its overall meaning. So there's still only one ascriptive subact, but what do we call a configurational property, that is to say a regular configuration of the predicate hit and its two arguments, he and the ceiling. Notice, however, that while the actor argument he could be substituted by any noun phrase, the undergoer has to be singular and definite for the idiom to work. He hit a ceiling or he hit the ceilings cannot have the idiomatic meaning. And since the undergoer can also appear as a roof, it's enough here to have a frame with the operator singular and definite pre-specified. And then there's a third type. Exemplified by he spilled the beans, meaning he revealed the secret. This idiom is both motivated and semantically decomposable. There are clear metaphorical relations between spilling and revealing, and between beans that have been hidden in a can and secret information. Enough in any case to motivate the idiom, and then also spill the beans is decomposable in the same way as reveal the secret, spill the beans. But since the constituent elements cannot be changed in any way, Kaiser proposes a frame with the predicate and the undergoer fully pre-specified, grammatically and lexically, as shown on your slide. So we conclude that a lexeme is typically attributed to a frame in which everything is left variable, but in the case of idiomatic expressions, it is attributed to a partially instantiated frame, as Kaiser calls it. Now, this notion turns out to have wide applicability, in fact, beyond the area of idiomatic expressions. Um, in my work on self-prefixed verbs in English, in which I reported in an Abralim talk, given while I was self-isolating. Oh, that's an example of what I was talking about. Self-isolate. I argued, that some of you may remember, that a verb such as self-isolate involves the assignment of the verb isolate to a partially instantiated frame, as shown here. The partial instantiation in this case involves what we call a lexical operator, namely self. We call it an operator because it has a grammatical role as a prefix of reflexivity, and lexical because it takes the form of the lexical morpheme self. 
So these last examples and areas of attention have reflected what has been a concern of many grammarians, functional and otherwise, in recent years. The tension between binarism and gradients. Okay, this is my um, second last slide, so the end is near. As um, Bas Arts puts it in the introduction to his interesting book on syntactic gradients, we have, and I quote him, a feeling of discomfort with not only the views of the radical categorizationalists, that is to say most linguists working in formal syntactic frameworks, but also with those of eclectic linguists for whom anything goes, with a gradients is everywhere perspective. Well, I suppose that the formalism of FDG predisposes us to be radical categorizationalists, since any element of formulation must be classified as either interpersonal or representational, an argument as either an actor or an undergoer, a countable individual as either singular or plural, and so on. Yet we've seen that the distinction between lexical and grammatical is in practice very hard to make although each category occupies very different places in the FDG model. However, Evelyn Kaiser's proposing lexical operators as an intermediary category reflects the kind of answer that's been favored in the past 10 years of FDG development. It uh, complexifies the theory, it is true, but it preserves the desire to categorize while doing justice to the indisputed, undisputed existence of gradients in the data. Another example is Garcia Velasco's notion of the flexible lexicon, in which a lexeme can be coerced into an unfamiliar environment. In that same book, Bas Arts gives the attested example an alive presence in which for reasons that plausibly have to do with the discourse context in which he found it, the exclusively predicative adjective alive occurs attributively, in FDG then as a restrictor rather than a predicate. And by assuming that the lexeme is not necessarily but only customarily associated with a particular frame set, we can open up FDG to gradients without losing the advantages of categorization. So I think we can summarize the FDG position as one of awareness of the gradient, flexible nature of the use of language, while not giving up on the possibility of analyzing intermediate categories as just that, as categories. Perhaps this is another example of the FDG motto of moderation in all things. As the Greek poet said, metra, Philosophy, Kairos Tepi Pasin Aristos. So, to end by summarizing very briefly, I feel I should conclude with an apology to the apology to the producers of the immense amount of work that I have not been able to even mention but I do hope that I've given a reasonable impression of an active international community working on a wide range of different projects under a shared set of principles. The principles that emerged in the early years of FDG, mainly in the first decade of this century, have been largely upheld. But in some of the ways I've tried to sketch today, these principles have been refined, expanded, loosened, but always in response to the exigencies of the data. We now have a much fuller picture of the overall architecture and of the contribution that FDG can make to language description and to language typology. I look forward to future developments and more immediately to any reactions that you may have in the minutes left for discussion. Many thanks for your attention. Muito obrigado pela vossa atenção. Nós é que agradecemos, Lahan, por essa fala de uma clareza esplendorosa. Foi, foi, a gente não percebeu o tempo passar. 
a sensação é de acompanhar ao vivo o desenvolvimento de uma teoria. É, eu confesso, estou falando aqui como Marise, não exatamente como mediadora, mas eu confesso que foi é, como se você estivesse explicando para as pessoas por que, que a gente gosta tanto dessa teoria, por que, que a gente se, se apaixona tanto pelo modo como vocês explicam. Eu tenho um monte de coisa que eu gostaria de falar, mas a minha função aqui é ser mediadora, então depois a gente conversa. É, tem vários comentários que fala maravilhosa, muito obrigada, que fala esplendorosa, a Thaís, ah, Erotilde, parabéns, Larran, que ótima síntese e avaliação da FDD e dos seus resultados. E a gente tem aqui duas perguntas, é, que, algumas perguntas que eu gostaria de colocar para você. A primeira é da Thaisa, é, outro comentário dela. Larran, que fala esclarecedora, muito obrigada. Uma pergunta, como você falou sobre avanços e questões que foram sendo incorporadas... Como você pensaria um lugar na GDF para pensar habilidades cognitivas como a capacidade de generalização e abstração? Continuando. Digo, a GDF opera com esquemas mais prontos e específicos. Como pensar, então, na GDF esquemas mais abstratos, já que muito da significação e das relações gramaticais se resolvem no ato de uso em si? Yes. Well, I don't have an easy answer to that because it's a very uh, high-level question, which I appreciate very much and exactly what I would expect from Thais. Um, we do believe to some extent in um, a difference between general properties of thought and specific properties of the linguistic system. So um, we remain a little skeptical about the approach that you see in many um, more cognitively oriented uh, approaches in which um, notions that have to do with the categorization of non-linguistic phenomena are uh, generalized to the categorization of linguistic phenomena. And uh, that may well be defensible in, in many cases, but um, it seems too that there are specific elements of language that uh, resist that kind of analysis, or at least for which that kind of analysis is, is not particularly revealing. So, um, I would say that we certainly, uh, it, it's a question of, of awareness. And um, I think in FDG, we really have to be aware of the work that's being done um, around us, not just only in our own community. Awareness, but um, there isn't terribly much there that we can put into action within the principles of our theory. Ok, obrigada. Nós temos mais uma pergunta agora do Michel, também da Federal de Mato Grosso do Sul. Larra, nessa sua avaliação da teoria da GDF, o que se pode rever ou repensar em relação à estrita distinção entre léxico e gramática? Qual seria o espaço possível para a gradualidade no modelo? Yeah, well, of course, I, I, I did, in a sense, answer this in, in what I said. Uh, but I'm happy to, uh, to reformulate it to the extent that I can. Um, if you interpret graduality, if that's an English word, uh, gradients um, very literally, then it would su suggest um, an infinity of possibilities between the two extremes. What we observe in practice is um, a range of intermediary categories. Okay, so that if you take, for example, uh, an area that I myself have worked in, the area of nominalization, right? Then we, sign, we find certain forms that are more verbal, and then a gradual um, uh, series of steps 
in which each following step is less verbal and also with the loss of verbality comes a gradual increase in nominality. And uh, so that it's, it sends meets in the middle um, in those languages that have verbal nouns that combine the properties of verbs and nouns. Other languages have even other steps between the verbal noun and either of the extremes. So it's possible then in an FDG approach, I think, to um, distinguish various steps en route from one extreme to the other. The trouble about gradients, if it's taken too literally, is that you then end up lacking categories altogether. So we're happy to add intermediary categories, but not to give up on the notion of categorization. And in that way, try to take that kind of moderate view that I argued for at the end, that lies somewhere between binarism, that's to say something is either a verb or a noun, and nothing can be created that is uh, intermediary between the two, and gradients, which allows for an infinity of possibilities between one extreme and the other. Okay, thank you, another. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> agora estou eu misturando inglês com português, mas acho que podemos continuar fazendo as perguntas para você em português, né? E, enfim, um, a próxima pergunta, Grande Larran, como sempre, uma pergunta não já... Desculpa, Grande Larran, como sempre, uma pergunta não técnica, mas sim estratégica. O que mais podemos fazer para aumentar a visibilidade do modelo fora da nossa comunidade? Well, yes. I, I think that's a very good question. That's, that, that's something that really does interest me. I think that uh, all of us in, within the community can do our, our, our best to um, present our work in a way that is consciously open to the understanding of, of others. Um, uh, Obviously, within the technicalities of our own academic articles, we can do nothing about the fact that our formalism is very precise and has to be respected. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's not going to work. On the other hand, um, when um, interacting with people that have different presuppositions, it must be possible to uh, find formulations that are uh, still rigorous but less oriented towards internal argument. But I think also we have to um, inform ourselves about what else is going on, all right? So that we have to be open to other approaches and to observe convergences and overlaps. Okay, so there in, I'm, I'm convinced that there are many people working in other approaches who are, have very similar ideas, but maybe use different terms, or have slightly different uh, presuppositions, and uh, that uh, opportunities for convergence from both sides should be, um, uh, should be looked at. What I did find disappointing, and uh, that's why I decided to quote that colleague of mine, who um, uh, seemed almost to take a pride in ignorance about FDG, right? Who was quite happy Uh, and the editor also let it through to, to say, well, I don't understand what Mackenzie's doing because I've never studied FDG. You know, that to me, it seems to me, uh, is uh, a, kind of a sort of intellectual laziness. And uh, let us at least not be equally guilty of that. Ok, uh, we have a lot, uh, nós temos um monte de, de comentários, todos okay. muito positivos, eu vou ler alguns para você. Um, Sandra, Denise, um, que exposição tão didática, parabéns, Lahan, obrigada. Daniel Velasco, beautiful talk, Lahan, thank you so much. Márcia Nogueira, parabéns, Lahan, muito obrigada. Talita faz um comentário interessante sobre as nossas reuniões mensais. Lahan, sua fala foi magnífica. Você contemplou os avanços da GDF de modo esclarecedor. Gostaria de dizer que as lectures mensais nos permitem refletir com frequência sobre o modelo e nos dão muitas ideias para futuras pesquisas. Adoro. 
Rafael. If I can, yeah, Sorry. If I can just say, um, yeah, I think too that these monthly meetings are, are great. The important thing is um, not just to have like a conference every two years and, and, and then like a peak of interest in FDG around the time of the conference and then everybody returns to their daily duties. Okay, but by having this monthly meeting, we manage to keep the pot boiling and to keep the level of interest and enthusiasm high. So uh, long may it continue and many thanks to, uh, to Hella uh, for um, organizing it so effectively and um, ensuring that there's always something for us to yes. work on every month. Um, Rafael Cavicchioli, parabéns, professor Lahan, explicação na aula de hoje online, muito boa, muito obrigada. Uh, Flávia, great talk, Lahan, glad to see you again. Uh, eu já fiz a pergunta do Euboro. Pablo Jadel, uma exposição maravilhosa, muito obrigada. Vários outros comentários, okay. todos eles. Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm delighted. I'm, I'm very pleased because uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I have the highest regard for Sylph and for the people who work in it. And uh, I, I, I wanted to, to do a good job for you all. Thank you again. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to have you here with us. It was one hour of lights. Okay. Thank well, you for all of that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm delighted. Então, acho que com isso nós encerramos essa uh, mesa de essa conferência de encerramento e eu convido vocês para depois do intervalo uh, termos a nossa última mesa com todos os ex-presidentes uh, do Silf e vamos fazer na sequência a indicação uh, da, da nova sede do Silf para o Sétimo Silf. Muito obrigada a todos por essa tarde maravilhosa. Obrigada, Larra, mais uma vez. E até daqui a pouco. Até daqui.